Welcome and thank you for attending and welcome to this meeting for the Cooperative Executive. Can I first of all wish everybody who is watching this a uh, happy new year and I don't know where we, the cut-off line is at but uh, we'll, we'll take that as um, given. The meeting today is open to the public although there, there is a reduced room capacity to ensure COVID secure environments and that social distancing is properly observed. The meeting will be webcast live and the recording will be available for people to view later through the Council's website. As a result of the Government's Plan B, no members of the public are present today. Their questions will be read out by an officer. Report authors who are presenting items today that are observing the meeting on the screen from the reception room, they will be invited into the chamber for their individual items. This may mean that there is a short pause in between these items to allow them to make their way to the room. I therefore ask for your patience to allow this to be managed safely. Please can I request that mobile telephones and such equipment are switched to silent so as to not disturb the conduct of this meeting. There is no fire test planned today. If there is an emergency evacuation, please take instruction from the town hall staff. The assembly point is Tudor Square. And as you all know, I love Tudor Square. Ask each cooperative uh, executive member, we will introduce ourselves and anything else uh, that we need to mention uh, in the process of this meeting. So I'd like to introduce myself. I am Councillor Terry Fox. I am leader of Sheffield City Council and I'm also chair of today's meeting. Julie. Good afternoon. I'm Councillor Julie Greyfoot, the executive member for community engagement and government. Councillor Jane Dern, Executive Member for Education, Children and Families. Uh, good afternoon, Councillor Kate MacDonald, and I'm the Exec Co-op Member for Finance and Resources. Thank you, Chair. I'm George Lars Hammond, and I'm uh, the Executive Member for Health and Social Care. Um, hello, uh, my name is Councillor Alison Teal and I'm Executive Member for Sustainable Neighbourhoods, Wellbeing, Parks and Leisure. Uh, thank you. Um, Councillor Douglas Johnson, Executive Member for Climate Change, Environment and Transport. Councillor Paul Turpin, Executive Member for Inclusive Economy, Jobs and Skills. Th th thanks, Paul. I'll also uh, ask the Executive Officers to introduce themselves. Uh, John. Thank you, Chair. John McElwraith, Executive Director for People Services. Abby, uh, Abby Hodgetts, Principal Committee Secretary. Eugene. Eugene Walker, Executive Director of Resources. Thank you, Sarah. Sarah Bennett, Assistant Director, Legal and Government. Thank, thanks, everyone. And obviously, we'll get on with today's um, agenda. Um, apologies for absence, Abby. Thank you, Chair. We've had apologies for absence from councillors Paul Wood and Maza Iqbal, and also apologies from Kate Josephs. Th th thank you. Um, exclusion of the press and public. Have we any items today, Abby? Uh, yep. Yeah, uh, agenda item 17. On the agenda, there's an appendix which is not available to the public or press because it contains exempt information. If members wish to discuss the information in the appendix, um, we will ask um, members of the public and press to kindly leave for that part of the meeting. We'll halt the webcast. That, thank you. And if members could consider that before we start the item, it would be much appreciated if we got to ex ex exclude. Um, on the next issue is declarations of interest. Uh, have we got any today? If not, thank you. Uh, minutes of previous meeting. Can we agree those? Great, thank you. Item six, public questions and petitions. Um, these will be read out as said at the beginning by, by uh, Abby. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the Council has received an electric petition containing 228 signatures um, opposing the clean air zone charging. Uh, there is no speaker to the petition. Douglas. Would you like to just speak to it? Thanks, um, 
uh, very briefly, uh, Chair, um, as well know, the, the clean air zone obviously seeks to uh, reduce air pollution um, across the city. And the reason for that is essential to improving the health of everyone who lives and works in Sheffield. Um, we know that, that uh, air pollution contributes to about 500 early deaths every year in Sheffield, um, and that's something we can't accept. Um, we need to take action on it. We also have a legal duty to introduce um, a clean air zone, and that's the rationale behind it. There's been very extensive consultation, and there's been a um, consultation that's just closed on a separate um, issue related to that. Um, the, I want to note that the zone is not proposing to charge cars. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what angle the petition is coming from. Um, you know, and so it is not going to um, affect the general travelling public in, in that particular way. It will improve everyone's health. Um, so I think that's all I need to say on that, um, given the petition isn't here. Thank you. Th th thanks, Douglas. Abby? Thank you, Chair. Um, the Council has received an electric, uh, electric petition containing 33 signatures opposing the plans to install red lines on Ecclesaw Road. Again, there's no speaker to this position, petition. Thank, thank you, Abby. Do you want to say a few words? Uh, again, very briefly, because it's been well rehearsed in, in the media. There's been a very extensive consultation on the uh, proposal around Abbeydale Road and Ecclesaw Road, um, and lots and lots of people have responded to that. Um, the aim of the proposals, um, which largely include priority measures and junction improvements, are to make our, the, the buses in Sheffield better, because um, we know that's a big challenge. Um, there's been a you know, very extensive consultation. It's still open as of today. People can send their proposals in. So obviously I want to thank people for being interested in that and send that in. Um, and again, um, I, I don't think there's anything more for me to say given the petitioner isn't here. Thank you. Thanks, Douglas. Abby? Thank you. Uh, the Council has received um, a petition containing 63 signatures requesting the review and remo removal of the double yellow lines at the junction of Gainsford Road and Staniforth Road. Again, no, no speaker to this petition. Douglas? Uh, again, even briefer, I mean, this, uh, this is some lines that were put down in 1981, so we're into quite historical issues here. Um, uh, in short, I mean, it's, it's some issues around um, uh, just off Stanforth Road. Um, there is a bit more detail I have here, which I'll send in writing to the petitioner um, for their information. Um, but I, I think the, the upshot is that um, officers are indicate that they're willing to have a look at it and see uh, whether there's an issue there that could usefully be done with a sensible measure of resources. Thank you. Th thanks, Douglas. And we are meeting the residents and, and traders later today as well. Okay, okay, thank you. Abby? Uh, so moving on to questions now. The first question is received from Neil Schofield, who's the Joint Chair of Friends of Parkwood Springs. Um, I'm asking this question as Joint Chair of the Friends of Parkwood Springs, which is a large and active community group. We work in close partnership with the City Council to improve the whole of Parkwood Springs as a resource for people, wildlife and the natural environment. Later in this meeting, the Cooperative Executive will consider at item 10 a report entitled Parkwood Options Appraisal. Initially, the Friends Group had considerable concerns about parts of the proposal. However, since Christmas, we have been able to have very helpful discussions with officers and the cabinet, cabinet member. We remain absolutely opposed to an aspect of one of the options, that access by vehicles to the potential Skyline site might be from Cookswood Road, Shycliffe Road. However, we now understand why the Council needs to include that option in the process. Can the Cabinet Member confirm that in line with the Department of Transport Guidance, the Transport Options Study will include early identification of the environmental and community constraints and impact of each option alongside technical appraisals? We believe this is essential to ensure that fully informed decisions can be taken. Can he also reaffirm the Friends Group and any other appropriate community groups will be fully involved at every stage of the process from here on for the development of the potential Skyline site at Parkwood Springs to ensure that their views and concerns are given full weight of the process. Th thanks, Javier. Uh, I'll briefly uh, answer this on behalf of Councillor Masaripal, who sent his apologies for today, today but also um, if, if Neil or any of the friends from Parkwood Springs or any other uh, concerned parties who want to get in touch with Masaripal, I'm sure he'll answer them, uh, no problem. I know he's in regular contact. First of all, I'd just like to say that we do value 
all our friends groups and all our community organisations. They are a, a massive part of, of the city and they help us on, on many occasions on, on their feedback and their participation. It's absolutely welcoming. I think it's been explained that we had to put this in the document because this was part of an assessment process and also that we will continually work with the uh, Friends Group. I think we will hear in the presentation later today that's on the agenda uh, how we are obviously working with them and if we have um, fell short on, on, on part of that consultation and process either through speed or because of uh, situations then uh, I, I do apologise uh, but I'm aware that we've got a fuller uh, agenda item on Pipewood so we hopefully people who are listening to this will be able to hear the report and our decisions ongoing. Uh, thank you very much. Next question. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, the next question is from uh, Mr Jeff Cox. In May 2021, the Cooperative Executive was formed around six commitments, one of which was to implement the recommendations in Arup's Pathways to Zero Carbon in Sheffield report. Is this Council still committed to implementing these recommendations by 2030? Has the investment funding necessary to implement these recommendations been secured? If not, please explain what steps are being taken to secure that funding and to what timescale. Thank you. Thank you. Douglas? Um, thank you. So in short, um, yes, the Council still has commitment to um, implement measures um, still on target for, or still with a commitment to reach net, uh, net zero by 2030. The investment funding needed, no. Um, no surprise there that we haven't got all the money we need for the next 10 years. Um, and steps being taken, um, in short, they, the approach to that is set out in the 10-point plan, which was um, published with the papers for the uh, Transitional Committee on Climate Change, e the Economy and Development, and which uh, will be coming here for uh, approval in due course. That's all. Thanks. Thanks, Rulis. Abby? So the next questions are from uh, Mr Nigel Slack. Uh, there's two questions. Question one, my apologies for the repetitive nature of this first question, but since I am yet to receive a reasonable response, I feel it necessary to continue asking, even in the face of such obstinate ignorance. Firstly, my thanks to the Deputy Leader for her response to question two from the set of specific questions first asked on 17th November 2021. Clearly the rules and expectations around recorded voting within Council is worthy of further conversation. The attached specific points with respect to the new plan for property services were first put to Council in questions 1 and 3 of that same November date, eight weeks ago following on from an initial question on the issues in October 2021. I repeated the questions for the December Executive meeting but Covid issues led to that meeting being cancelled, though the questions were forwarded to the Exec Member by Democratic Services. That question has not even received an acknowledgement, never mind any actual answers. I therefore wish to give the exec member one last chance to respond in detail before escalating the matter. Where, when might I expect a detailed response in writing? Please remember that council has had eight weeks to respond so far. Um, and question two, I share the leader's disappointment in the news that has come out over the last weekend about the behavior of the chief executive. I understand he's wanting to await the report of Sue Gray before looking into this further, but remain concerned over the independence of the Sue Gray inquiry and the likelihood that scapegoats will be sacrificed to save the big dog himself. Irrespective, how soon after that report is published might we expect the Senior Officer Employment Committee to meet and discuss the issues surrounding this revelation? Thank you, Chair. Th th thanks, Abby. Um, Kate, has the same question more? Uh, thank you, Chair. And I'm disappointed that Mr Slack's not here because I didn't have an opportunity to apologise to him in person. I did actually prepare a um, sorry, I think I pressed the wrong button. I did actually prepare a response for the uh, December executive meeting, and I did actually submit it for uh, a you know written response to him. So I apologise for somewhere in the organisation that's that's got lost, but it that it isn't the case that um, uh, his apology wasn't acknowledged, or um, in fact he didn't get an answer, but somehow um, all of the um, confusion around uh, the meetings has obviously got in the way somewhere so I do apologise to him for that and actually the other reason I was disappointed is I've got a bumper response for him I've got um, five pages of detail which I'm sorry I couldn't give him myself today it would take too long really to read it all out and I won't I don't think that's appropriate but we can make sure that, that that's sent to him and I hope he's watching 
Th thanks, Kate. I'll, I'll obviously answer question two. I'd just like to say that since I was informed of the issue on Thursday afternoon, I have been taking advice and following due process. I have announced uh, that a committee is to be set up to look into the matter and establish the facts. The statement is now as fact. The committee is expected to begin its work tomorrow, and while we cannot yet know how long it will take, we expect it to move at pace. We will be sharing the names of those on the committee shortly, and all powers will be handed over to the, that committee. Thanks, Ms. Thanks, Abby. Can we now move to the next item? Uh, items called in for scrutiny. Is there any? No. Uh, next item, retirement of staff. Item 8. That is obviously an extensive amount of service on this report. Can we as an exec place on record our appreciation of the valuable service recommended to the City, uh, to the city Council by the members of staff in the portfolios stated, extend to them our best wishes for the future and a long and happy retirement and direct that an appropriate extract of this resolution now made under the common seal of this council be forwarded to those staffs for over 20 years service. Can we agree that? Thank you and thanks to that member of those members of staff. Item 9, agreement with the proposed COVID memorial activity in Sheffield. Can we have the uh, Officer to report. Right, thank you everyone. Um, thank you Paul for, for coming today. Obviously um, we, we await this uh, COVID memorial uh, and look forward to your report. Thanks. Thanks Chair. Um, yeah, this report is to update cooperative executive members on the proposed COVID memorial activity for Sheffield and seeks, and seeks agreement to those proposals and ask for any other thoughts and guidance that the members may have. Um, I think mo most members have been aware that this has been quite a long time in the, in the gestation, really. We, we, we first met back in March. Um, we, we developed through a, a sort of multi-agency, multidisciplinary group, a number of proposals. And the intention today really is to get sign-off to those proposals so that really we can, as a city, we can get on with it. Um, Members who have seen, there are three elements. There's a memorial archive, whereby citizens can leave memories of loved ones who've lost, been lost during the pandemic, or maybe just celebrate the way that people have come together during the pandemic, or really any other reminiscences that people want to leave. Secondly, we propose a memorial trail, 
um, that people will be able to follow around the city um, to, to then come to the, the memorial within the centre. We're primarily proposing that that's pushed out through the local area committee structure so that all of the likes will have a sum of money. You'll see there are a number of different visions about how that might work, but basically they'll have a sum of money to design the proposal in, in conjunction with local communities. Um, you'll see that um, Teaching Hospitals Trust are very keen to get on board with this as well, so there would also be a site in the trail uh, related to Northern General and to Royal Hallamshire. Um, and finally, a centralised memorial. So we do agree that we need some sort of centralised memorial. We, we see that as being a really good opportunity to involve everybody in Sheffield, really, by, by, by coming up with some ideas and then asking people what, what, they, what they think about it all, really. And then once we've got, we've got an idea of what everybody in the city wants or some consensus, then we can move to a process to, to get that sorted. Um, members will see that we're proposing that the funding for this comes from public health underspend. Um, people are probably familiar with the idea of compassionate cities and compassionate Sheffield. So we, we tie all of this activity into um, giving people better experiences of death, dying and bereavement supported by their communities. Um, and, and that, that's been signed off, so that's, that's all, all been agreed. So that's, we've got funding in place. Um, you can see at one six how we're proposing that funding is, is, is divided up. The Memorial Archive work is underway. We've already had bids received. We're currently moderating those bids, so as long as we get approval today, the Memorial Archive stuff will then, will then start to roll forward. Um, in terms of the um, trail, we need to speak with lap chairs, decide how we're going to do that, start rolling that forward. And then the city centre memorial, we, we see that as very much involving local media, people like that to sort of get, get generate interest and, and ideas and hear what people think. In terms of timescales, we, we put August 2022, that may be a little bit ambitious. Really, we've gone with that timescale because the intention is that people can get involved, especially in the memorial trail stuff. So it gives people a chance over the spring and the summer to be part of, of those activities. So we have that real ownership of, of what we come up with. Um, and we, we, we're using this really as a kickoff for communications as well. I mean, members will be aware that um, it's a bit of a, a weird thing. The star keep putting stuff out there about how, how um, Sheffield hasn't got a memorial, but, but, but we, are, we are planning. And so now we're able to share all of those details and that will, that will start a discussion, I think, um, across the city, so um, so we can move that forward. In terms of overall project management, um, up until now, a few people are aware, it's basically been, been me sort of leading on this from the council side of things. Um, really, we're saying there needs to be more of a shift towards a place portfolio, but I think actually, in reality, it'll probably end up being a project team so that the capital aspects of it can be taken care of, the, consult the consultation aspects and everything, so we can have a project team dealing with various elements. Um, in terms of, of keeping members informed going forward, there are four elected members who are actually on the, on the group, on the steering group, but it may be that the cooperative executive may decide that somebody here may act as a sort of conduit and then we can, we'll sort of have that connection with yourselves, but obviously we'll report back here as necessary. And then also at CMT on the 10th of January, a suggestion was made that we, we should perhaps also think about public subscription. And I think that there may be an appetite in the city for people to want to donate towards, towards memorial activity, which means that we could, we could broaden the scope out and, and broaden that ownership. So, so I'm more than happy to follow that through. That, that, thank you, Paul. Um, and obviously, our pleas for everybody in Sheffield to, to get involved in this. Um, any questions for Paul? If not, is there any comments? Alison? Thanks very much, Paul. Um, yeah, I think that it's really appropriate that we're taking our time. I, that feels really right to me because it is still ongoing and um, to have rushed through it and already have um, a memorial. I know some places have and I'm not meaning to be critical of that, but I'm just really glad that, that we as a city are taking our time and considering this carefully. And if it do, does go beyond August, certainly that's no issue at all. And I imagine that the centralised memorial is probably going to take considerably longer than that, but it will be a much better experience uh, for taking that time. So, yeah, I'm, I'm pleased to be uh, getting involved with this now. It's a really, really interesting project. Thank you. Thanks, Alison. Kate? Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to ask Paul, uh, uh, 
I just wanted to say thank you to Paul and the team that have done the work. Um, I really appreciate it. It's a very sensitive approach to a, a highly sensitive area. Um, so thank you for all that work and thank you for the approach as well. As a matter of interest, the person, the, in, the member of the public who joined the, um, the group actually is one of my constituents who, who got in contact with me because he wanted to offer some help. So actually having, I put him in touch with, with Paul and he's become a member of, of the group. So we have been very inclusive in the approach as well. So thank you. That, that, thanks, Kate. Paul? Yes, just, just to, to come back to Councillor Teal's point, yeah, that, that's very much been a, a driver that the pandemic is still ongoing. We were aware that other, other places were, were putting up memorials quite early on, but the group was, was very concerned that we were sort of memorialised something which was still very much a live issue. And a couple of times we got quite near to, to moving forward and then we backed off because, once again, the pandemic flared up. So, um, so yes, I, 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 I agree. I think it's the right approach that we take our time and make sure it's, it's a fitting memorial for Sheffield. Thanks, Ben. Paul, Julie. Um, again, thank you, Paul, for your work on this. It, it is a very sensitive issue, and it is something that you know touches everyone across the city. It is right that when the time is right, we do have an appropriate memorial that I'm sure will give lots of people a great deal of comfort. I also like how you are widening the approach to this, so that we are also celebrating um, the work of people, not only our key workers, but individuals across the city who have done um, a great deal of work and, you know, really shown the city in its true light. I really do like the idea, you know, we have been a city of sanctuary for a long time, but, you know, Sheffield, the city of sanctuary and compassion, I think absolutely sums up what we are as a city. So I really do like um, the idea of that. And just one final comment from me. In the north of the city, we do have town and parish councils, and it may be worth just touching base with them because there may be something that they would like to um, engage in as well, particularly when we start talking about the memorial trails and things. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I think okay. it's also important to, to make the point that we're not saying that other memorial activity can't happen. And I think there was, there was a little feeling of that early on about, oh, crikey, there's, there's this happening, so what about things that parish councils want to do? And that's fine, and I think really what we want to try and do is incorporate whatever's going on, so we have a, a sort of, you know, a, a full city response, really, so absolutely take that point. Thank you, George. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, I'll echo um, Colin's comments about, about the, the work that's been done. It's, 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 very, it's very much needed. I'll just say one thing and ask a question. Um, I just know I really welcome um, the work um, to link this in with um, Compassionate Cities. I think Compassionate Cities' agenda is um, something that's really powerful and something that um, I know is in my position as co-chair of the Health and Wellbeing Board in Sheffield that we were starting to look at before um, the pandemic and, um, and I think it is something that, that merits much further exploration if it can help that that's a really positive thing for people um, at all stages of life actually. Um, my question really is that we've talked, you talked about you know, the memorial trail linking the city and there's obviously differing views on the speed of doing memorials, but but um, what have you learned, and and also what plans are there for links with other places? As most places will be um, putting in place some form of memorial plans, will this or could this link in with a form of a national memorial um, strategy or um, or foundation, or do we see this as you know purely about our ideas and, and driven from Sheffield alone? Thank you. Yeah, it, it, certainly we, at the start, really, we were thinking in terms of what's, what's the, the national picture. And there isn't really that much of a, of a momentum in, term, in terms of national memorialisation. So we, we have tended to go a little bit sort of our own way. <coughs> Having said that, we, we've got some people from Lab for Living at Sheffield Callum Uni who, who are very good at, at magpieing the sort of stuff that's going on around the country. So we're getting lots of ideas in, in terms of what other people are doing and sort of filtering that through in terms of is the stuff there that we could we could usefully use and do and do something with um, but um, to, to a degree it's very Sheffield we basically we're getting clear on what we want to do and, and we just want to make it happen but we are we are mindful of things that are going on elsewhere and, and again when when citizens have contacted me some of that's been well we see that this is happening in London or this is happening over there and is that something that we could have a think about and obviously we take all that on board as well 
Jane. Yes, thank you, Paul. This is really kind of really, really moving because it's in three parts, which I really, really like. Um, I just want to add, our young people, I really would like to see their input through this because especially the memorial that we're going to have in the city centre, and I think about the Women of Steel and how kind of everybody gravitates towards that. It doesn't matter who comes to the city now, they want to be seen next to it. And it's just... I mean, and I think this, this is something that our children's children are going to talk about forever because this is history. So it'd be really lovely if we could involve them in that and then they'll be able to tell their children and their grandchildren. So I think that would just make it really part of history moving forward. And also our people that are suffering with dementia. Uh, it's been particularly hard for them to have kind of how that has affected somewhere in this and feeding in. And I know it probably fit in with the memory trail because that fits into memories. So when they're walking around, maybe we could think about that when we're pushing that in as we are a dementia-friendly city. So it's really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we, um, we have been very mindful about young people uh, and, the, and how the pandemic's impacted young people. One of the we, we have a number of grant giving organizations who are part of the memorial group and they're sort of thinking off separate to this about something some you know whether there could be some sort of trust that would that would help to um help to rectify some of the stuff that young people have lost but i think i think the important thing to say is although we've done a lot of planning up to now this is this is really the start if we get the approval today then that's the point at which we think how do we better involve how do we better involve young people how do we involve people with dementia mentioned in the report about being aware of the, the disproportionate impact of the pandemic in different areas and different communities and again once we once we've got clearance today then we can start to, to make all of that stuff a reality so thank you all we'll make sure we feed that in Th thanks everyone and I've, I've received obviously emails with people outpouring emotion grief etc and i will get those people a reply um and and it is incumbent on us all to get a place where people can reflect and communicate, uh, commemorate uh, around loved ones buried in some of the times when people weren't able to do that and a place where we can do that together. With that in mind, we've got recommendations on page 36. Are we, uh, can we agree those recommendations and get this process going? Thanks and thanks, uh, Paul. Uh, please keep this Corp Exec updated and the people of Sheffield. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. We now wait for the next officer. I think the next item is Backwood Springs. Thank, thank you. Um, Tammy, can you introduce yourself and then introduce the report? Thank you. Hello, um, my name is Tammy Whitaker. I'm Head of Regeneration and Property Services at the City Council. Um, the purpose of the report today is to provide an update on the ski village site at Parkwood Springs. Um, in summer, um, the Council took the decision to terminate the agreement for lease with Extreme uh, and to undertake a review and options appraisal of how we move forward with this particular part of the wider Parkwood Springs site. 
We've now completed the review and an options appraisal which is presented in the report on the best way forward to deliver the original vision as set out in the Parkwood Master Plan, of which the Ski Village site forms part. The review identified many challenges in bringing forward the, the development of the Ski Village element of the site, in particular around poor access um, and the need to find forms of access into the site and that means all forms of access, whether that's pedestrian, on foot, connections to the city centre or by road, to look at some of the site constraints, um, particularly around the contamination, um, issues around it being a former landfill site and some of the connections into the site um, and um, the remnants of the former ski village which still remain on site. One of the, the real issues we've got is that um, during the period that Extreme was subject to the agreement for lease, they undertook very little investigation and that meant that the council was unable to access or secure the funding from the mayoral combined authority to address some of the viability challenges. Um, in order to move forward, we've now undertaken um, a, a period of soft market testing um, and scoped some of the works that are required to bring the development forward. The soft market testing um, was to understand the, the current market context and the, the market in appetite and interest in the site as we're now several years on from when the original agreement was made with Extreme. What the market testing confirmed was that there was strong interest in the concept of development of the ski village element of the site, but that in order to take the development forward, um, interested parties would want a prepared site or public funding in order to deliver and also potentially an ongoing public sector support or risk sharing appetite with the council. Uh, they would also want to take forward the development in an incremental approach. And this would be potentially costly to the council and would be time consuming in order to deliver. In the meantime, we've also continued discussions with Skyline Luge, a company who were who had a land interest in the site as a part of the agreement with Extreme. Skyline have uh, undertaken considerable investment in terms of bringing forward proposals for the site in the past, and they have stated that they are still interested in bringing forward development on the site to develop a broader uh, offer around the Gravity Park, which would be a very much a family orientated experience and um, catering for everybody <coughs> from 0 to 99, toddlers to grandparents visitors and the local community alike, and set in the ski village within the context of the wider country park. Um, but they still have similarly concerns around access and site constraints, um, which need to be addressed, and want to work with the city council in order to address these. But unlike the others, they would be willing to take on the development and accept the operational risk. The options appraisal therefore proposes that the City Council continues discussions with Skyline about whether the development can be brought forward with them as a willing partner and how that, that can be brought forward in a timely manner. They have um, a good financial standing track record and we believe that they would bring the site forward quicker. However, the next steps um, in order to secure and continue discussions with Skyline um, it's still clear that there would be a requirement for a number of issues to be addressed on the site. And in order to do that, one of the, the key elements is to understand how uh, better access could be secured into the site by all means of uh, transport, whether that's on foot, cycle or by road, uh, and links through to public transport um, opportunities. In order to do that and in order to secure funding to make that happen, um, a full assessment of the possible access routes into the site is required, taking on board all the site constraints and the wider country park and the investment that's already been made. Uh, there was a question earlier on, um, I understand, around um, working to look at all of the issues around environmental, ecological strengths and com community concerns. And at this stage, this is an assessment of all the options. It wouldn't be a decision on the best course of action. Um, but we would assess all of the options and then bring that forward for decision. Um, the, the access constraints and the, the report would also inform Skyline's proposals and how they then developed out the site. Um, I should also reiterate the statement that Councillor Fox made at the beginning, that we are really keen to work alongside all st stakeholders and the friends groups, and we've had several discussions with the friends groups over the last month or so, 
Um, and as proposals and progress um, continues, we will continue that engagement and we are committed to developing a full community and engagement process uh, and being clear about our communications. So the report um, asks um, for a number of recommendations, particularly around carrying out the transport assessment, site investigations and surveys in order for us to access additional funding. To enable um, officers to progress discussions with Skyline and to develop a clear commun communication and engagement strategy to ensure the local community and other stakeholders involved are involved in the as the proposal is developed. And in addition, we'll begin to explore opportunities to secure funding um, once we have the um, feedback from surveys. Further decisions will then be brought forward to cooperative executive, uh, particularly on completion of the technical assessment um, and the details of the proposals um, if we manage to work something up um, clearly with Skyline. Um, it's important to recognise that this is one element of the work that's ongoing on the Parkwood site. It refers specifically to the ski village, um, former ski village area. Um, obviously, there is a lot of other good work going on around in the Parkwood site, which this forms part of the, the whole offer. Thank, thanks, Tammy. Um, thanks for that uh, concise report. Any questions on this, Douglas? Actually, can I just first make a declaration of interest, just to be absolutely clear? Um, I'm probably a member of the Friends of Parkwood Springs. I, I didn't say probably because I actually have no idea how they're constituted, but it is a group I have been involved with for a long time. Um, so just personal interest there, just for the sake of caution. So not a question as such. I've got another comment I'd like to make, having made that declaration, but I don't know if anyone else wants to come in first. Yeah. Thank, thanks, Douglas. Um, carry on. Uh, so, so I only say that from that position of you know, knowing, knowing the group well, um, and I can certainly support their concern that uh, with the access road there, it is a very good and very um, knowledgeable and um, thoughtful friends group. It's well worth talking to them. So I was going to say, I think it's worth noting that their concern specifically, I can just record it was uh, to paragraph 219 in there, uh, yeah, that's, um, but they did express to me that they're perfectly happy with the rest of the report that they'd seen. It's just 2.19 that caused some concern. Um, and then following that, um, I'm actually grateful to Tammy for having some equally thoughtful um, ways of addressing their concern. And then there has been a meeting with the Friends Group and uh, with other people. Um, it, it, I think, Tammy, you were there, but certainly you know, Council Iqbal was as well, and, and Friends Group. There has been progress there, and that's resulted in the um, commitment that is at 6.2 of the report, that I think we're now being asked to endorse formally as part of that. Um, so I'm just saying that you know, I welcome that. There has been a lot of good movement since the draft of this report came out, because I think it's really important to just include those people who've got something to contribute. Um, and on top of that, I'll just say it, it's a good scheme. It's, um, it's a site that's been welcome, waiting for this for a long time. So it's welcome. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Douglas. Julie? Yeah, it's, it's just a, a few comments from me. I think over the last few years, we've shown how we've been very um, ambitious as a city in relation to regeneration. I think it's important that we do continue that. The proposals do seem sensible for the site, and I'm pleased to see that we are addressing the concerns that the Friends of Parkwood Springs have been um, raising. We are the outdoor city. This seems like a fantastic way to grow and build our brand as the outdoor city. So I think that we should um, be welcoming it. And a personal plea for me, when we get to the end of this project, can Councillor Fox please be the first one on the zip line? I don't know about that one, but yes, it might get some speed up. Um, Kate. Uh, thank you, Chair. So I'd like to thank um, Tammy for the report. I've seen a lot of the, all the hard work that's, that, and the discussion with stakeholders that's gone on uh, behind the scenes on this one. First of all, I'd like to assure the people of Sheffield that this council is committed to this exciting project uh, for the ski village and as part of the outdoor city. And secondly, to assure the friends and other stakeholders that they will continue to be involved in engagement around the project as well. So I welcome the report and I welcome the proposals. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Tammy. Thank, 
Thanks, everyone, and thanks, Tammy. Um, the recommendations on page 48, can we agree to those recommendations? If so, I look forward to the, uh, the first <laughs> item. Thanks ever so much. Thank you. Thanks, Tammy. Okay, thanks and uh, welcome Janet, if you can just introduce yourself and then introduce the report, thank you. Hello, um, I'm Janet Sharp and I'm the Director of Housing at Sheffield City Council and the report I would like to introduce today um, is the annual housing revenue account, uh, business plan and HRA budget for 22-23. So, so the, the housing revenue account um, is one of many ring-fenced ring accounts that the Sheffield City Council manages. Uh, this one in particular um, is an account what, that obviously provides uh, the funding through rents and other charges to provide tenant services to council housing in the city. Um, and that rent covers um, any, any financial borrowing that we need to make, um, it funds tenant services, it also fully funds uh, the, the services that are provided from the wider council that support tenant management services and, and that's key because um, council housing services couldn't be provided without the support from all parts of the council to deliver its services. Um, it also um, funds um, its repair, any repairs, tenancy management, and also um, the long-term management and maintenance of council housing stock to make sure it is in good quality order and actually uh, we can maintain it well over the 30 years of the business plan. Um, and also, uh, in recent years, it also fully funds um, our new supply of council housing and you will recall that previous reports have come here uh, about providing uh, increase in about three, by about 3,100 new homes, uh, new council homes, uh, which is absolutely essential for us to be able to meet the increased demand for social housing in the city. So, uh, so the report um, talks about um, you know, the, the achievements uh, that is taking place um, it talks about future plans and also uh, makes reference this time um, in terms of um, the increased number of new, le new legislation and regulations facing housing that we need to make sure that as landlord we must comply with. Um, it sets out a number of priorities. These are priorities that we work closely with tenants 
on, uh, not just once a year, but throughout the year to make sure we capture their views about the service and what they would like to see happening for their homes uh, to make sure they're fa factored into the business plan. Um, and also, uh, to, it sets out you know, our capital investment priorities. Um, and I think you will see, as the appendix to this report, the level of investment that is going to be spent both on the existing uh, council housing stock and new supply um, over the next five years. And that is, that is significant. Um, if we get that investment in place, then hopefully we should be able to see um, a steady reduction in responsive repairs um, over future years because we will obviously be doing planned works in advance to try and make those homes um, as, as, you know, the quality that we want to exist. So there are a number of appendices to the report uh, that sets out the finances of the business plan. Um, it sets out, obviously, the investment programme. It also sets out rents and charges. And, in, it also, and so um, the purpose of the report is obviously setting out the clear priorities. And on page 53, there are a number of recommendations. It is recommended that the rent for council housing uh, in 22-23 um, are increased by 4.1%. That means that we would be following the national rent standard for rent increases, and that similar will be applied to uh, temporary accommodation um, and also um, uh, garage rents. One of the things, we also provide enhanced services to many social housing tenancies, and we are recommending that they go they're increased by the rate of inflation, which in September was 3.1%. And that will include, obviously, the charges that we uh, pass on to our residents in sheltered schemes, uh, burglar alarms, and obviously furnished accommodation. We do recognise that any increase in costs will be difficult for many families. So one of the things that we have done um, is increased our hardship fund over the next few years. Um, and that is so that we can continue to work really closely um, with any tenants that feel that they are in hardship and need that little bit of extra support um, until, we, until obviously they, they can manage any additional costs. One of the things that we also try and ensure is that any costs they are passing on is those families that are obviously in receipt of benefits, that obviously benefits can increase uh, in line with those increases. So, so although, you know, there is um, increasing costs, you know, we're also reflecting that in the business plan and also bringing forth significant increase in both um, tackling uh, tenancy issues on our estates and also investing in council housing stock and bringing forward that, that new supply. So I think the report is fairly self-explanatory. More than happy to pick up any questions. Thank you. Th thanks, Janet. Thanks for the report. Jane. Thank you, Janet. Uh, thank you for the report. Um, I'd like to thank Councillor Wood. You know, I mean, he can't be here because he's poorly, but I know they have passionately he is about this, as I was. Do you know this? Um, I'm really, really pleased that you have increased the hardship fund. And I just uh, wondered if you could just give a little bit, bit, little bit of background knowledge about the rent increase, because we know that was not down to a decision from the council. It's a historical one that this wonderful Tory government thought was a good idea. And it's something that the tenants pushed back on, but they understood with the rent free. So if you could just clarify that, just for people that may be listening, just so they understand. Thanks. Yes, yes, certainly. Thank, thank you, Jane. And yes, um, you know, unfortunately, Councillor Wood couldn't be here today. And he's heavily involved, uh, as you were, in obviously the, both the review of the business plan and also to make sure that um, priorities and tenants' priorities are absolutely central to this review. So in terms of the, the rent increase each year, obviously one of the things that we do is nationally 
there is a national rent standard and that recommends the rent increase each year that uh, council tenancies should increase their rent and that's also reflected with other social landlords as well. So, so that increase would normally be whatever the inflation is in September of that year plus 1%. So we have taken that and that's been recommended that inflation in September was 3.1%. So that's how we've arrived at the 4.1%. Um, and you know, most landlords, if not all local authorities, will be recommending to their committees that that is the rent that need to increase by it for the next financial year. Thank, thanks, Jane. Thank you. Janet? Douglas? Um, thanks, Jan. Um, thanks, Janet. Um, I just want to reflect, first of all, that, of course, that's actually a hugely important report for the Council. And with all the, uh, the chat and concern we have about the revenue budget, which is the big event in March, the Housing Revenue Council belies a huge amount of work and anxiety going into it. So I just want to reflect that. So thanks to Janet and your team of officers right across the board to be working on that. Um, as James pointed out, you know, we're concerned about you know, tenants living there, rent increases are inevitable, we are in that situation, they're realistic, that's what they are. Um, I, I mean, looking at this, the thing that struck me was the, um, the, the big increase that we've got to face up to in the community heating charge, um, and this reflects the, the worlds that we are in nowadays, we, we can't criticise this. The reality is that the unit cost of the heating charge is almost doubling. Uh, for, for our tenants. Um, there isn't a way around that. As I said, that is the way the world is. Um, but of course, some of our tenants are people on fixed incomes, and it's massively important that we protect them where we can. Uh, this fits with um, everything that Greens we say about climate change um, and the, you know, the desperate need to um, increase the number of warm homes as much as possible. It's not just about warm homes and cheaper bills, but about the fact that cold homes do kill. It's been an incredibly bad impact on people's health, as well as the cost of heating these um, drafty homes. A lot of the council housing stock is good. Um, I've been up to date on my offices on that, um, within current standards. But I wanted to talk about um, an option for us to really drive this forward. This is meeting two really, really important agendas. One is about providing warm homes for our tenants that are cheap to run and secondly about actually tackling climate change and I don't mean just tinkering around with a few houses here and there and some pilots. We need to think if we're serious about um, our commitment to net zero by 2030 about a larger scale thing. We want to start this with council housing but to roll it out across all sectors of housing if we possibly can. Um, and so we've been looking at um, uh, this approach at scale, completely uh, new approach to providing homes that are fit to live in for this century. Um, there is an initiative called um, um, Energie Sprong for you Dutch speakers. Um, it's the, the, the leap forward on energy, um, and it is about a radical approach to do this. Um, the idea about this is about um, you know, factory built um, systems of walls, roofs entire uh, systems of air source heating, um, PV panels, and so on. Um, th this is a new initiative that can be done. And the significance of the increase in the community heating charge now is that these schemes have so much more potential for being viable. And if so, then um, the, on these schemes that have been tried so far, we're seeing um, you know, very good tenant satisfaction and that is something that you know, is, is important to us. So I'm not going to bring it forward as an amendment to this item today because it's not fully fleshed out. We're proposing to bring it as a, a, a formal but minor um, small amendment to the text for when this comes to the full council on the 2nd of February. So I just wanted to give people advance warning that we're thinking of this now. Um, hope to flesh that out and we really hope we'll support this because this does seem to be a win-win situation here and if we can get this flagged up now it will allow our officers to develop the proposals um, obviously without commitment but there is a really important window for us to um, um, get into a scheme with other councils who are 
um, involved in taking a lead on this around the country. Um, and we in Sheffield can get in there and join the leaders group um, in this sort of, um, this is an analogy to a race here. Um, we can get into the leaders group with this. Um, big issue here is that it's about capital investment in revenue returns. Um, there, it, the, the capital investment over the long term is paid by um, an increase of something called the warmth charge, which is paid by tenants. But there is a guarantee that they will not pay more than what they are paying at the moment in their combination of rent plus energy bills. Um, there is a tenant's guarantee attached to that. There are important savings to the council on it you know, massively escalating repairs project, on gas servicing, because we're talking about taking gas out of people's homes. Um, and we're also talking about claiming, maximizing our claims on government grants. This can happen, this does happen. Forward thinking authorities and social landlords around the country have been starting off on this. And I'm suggesting that we can see Sheffield join in this too. So I said, not bring this forward as an amendment today, will do, but I just want to flag that up and um, you know, invite some general support for that. Thank you. Th 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 thanks, Douglas. And uh, we'll look forward to that, that amendment coming at full council, I'm sure we will. Um, but anyway, Janet, do you just want to come back on some of those uh, comments around climate change and what we're doing with housing stock? Yes, certainly. Um, over you know, the last, you know, 10, 15 years. Um, Sheffield, to, Sheffield City Council, through its housing revenue account, um, we have been prioritising, you know, insulation. We have been replacing thousands of roofs. We have done internal insulation, external insulation, um, and also providing, you know, sort of like energy advice as well to our tenants to make sure uh, that they can afford to, to heat their homes and also keep safe and warm. Um, we are in a fortunate position um, in Sheffield is that we've got about 6,900 out of the 39,000 stock um, that is not at EPC uh, C. Um, and one of the priorities, as you will see in the business plan, is that we bring those 6,900 properties up to energy performance level C. Um, and that is presently obviously the, the standard um, that, that most local authorities are, are aiming for uh, in the short term. What we've also committed to is do a roadmap of, of what, what we would do and how we would improve stock to get uh, council housing stock from EPCC to closer to net zero, if that was possible to achieve. And we're doing a, a considerable amount of work on archetypes and looking at those technical solutions that will enable us to go beyond what we've presently factored into the business plan. Um, one of the things that we are also doing is, is looking at um, different models and also trying to attract significant levels of funding from the government's green grants program to contribute to the cost of that work. Um, moving the stock obviously from EPC level C to closer to net zero will be a considerable investment that's presently not all factored into the business plan so we need to, to look at the implications on the business plan. Um, and one of, but one of the things that we do want to do through that roadmap is look at how we may bring forward further improvements, but also, you know, we would need to consider the cash flow implications of the business plan and the priorities that are currently in the business plan um, to, and then obviously program in, uh, if it's approved, any further works that are required but I think, you know, there are some really interesting models across the country. You know, we do want to actually look at how we can go beyond um, EPCC, but we also want to make sure that, um, you know, that um, they can be afforded and also that other priorities and tenant priorities can also be afforded as part of the HRA business plan as well. Thank, well, th thanks, Janet. Uh, Kate? Thank you, Janet, and, and like Jane, I'd like to thank Councillor Root, who can't be with us today. 
Um, I'm looking at the priorities on uh, page 60 and um, I commend those priorities. I particularly want to mention two uh, that, uh, sorry, three, I've got three that I wanted to, to mention. First of all, the apprenticeships. That is absolutely crucial. And I, didn't, I was in a meeting with the trade unions yesterday and they were commending the approach that this council is taking to provide apprenticeships and jobs for young people and to, to help build up skills in our communities. So I would commend that in particular. I also am really pleased to see that we've maintained our ambition around increasing council housing stock. Um, we're one of the councils that's most ambitious in doing that and I'm, I'm pleased that that st still remains a priority despite all the other competing um, pressures that we've got on the um, uh, HRE, the housing revenue account. And the third thing, which is less obvious in here, but is really important to a lot of people um, and, and people in Jane's portfolio and in um, George's as well, is the work that, that you're doing with the other parts of the council to ensure that vulnerable people can actually have better um, access to housing that, that, um, that meets their needs. And that includes care leavers as well as, as, as older people and a much wider range of, of um, independent living schemes for older people. Fortunately, some of that's in, um, hopefully going to be in, in, in my ward as well. So this is a business plan for us as a, a landlord, but how we do it is really important as well. And I'd just like to thank you and your colleagues, as well as Councillor Woods, for this report. Thank you. Thanks. Jay, and I'll bring Paul. Jay. Is, is yours? Okay. Is, is there a question, Paul, of yours, or a comment? All right, well, I'll bring Jane in for a comment, then I'll bring yours in. Jane? Yeah, I just wanted to um, thank you and to say um, thank you for explaining so eloquently the, all the green credentials that we've got in our, you know, in our council house building. And I was really proud when we did some of the first new homes that were like that, but also had to be extremely disappointed when the government removed the tariff which meant that a lot of our solar panels weren't valid, do you know, and everything else. But really, really pleased that there is access to that funding. And it's something that I think we should be raising as a co-op executive, because this is tenants' money, and tenants are at the heart of helping us form this business plan. That's democratic and the way it should be. And to me, it will have a cost to make these homes hit net zero. And it shouldn't be build more homes, do more repairs, or hit net zero. This has to come from government. It, sh it needs to be, that is how it should be, and something that I, and I know Councillor Wood is really, really passionate about. So, I mean, it's a very, very, when we've got people desperately needing new homes, we need to be building the ones that hit the net zero, not only building one new home because we can only afford to do that. So I just wanted to make that comment, if it's okay, Chair. And thank you from all the care leavers. I know they are absolutely ecstatic. So thank you. <laughs> that, that, thank you, Jane. Paul? Thanks very much, Chair. Janet, thanks very much for this report. It's really good. Yeah, clearly, you've worked really hard on it, and it's, I think it's really good. Um, I was just thinking about, could it be even better? <laughs> And, um, and we've discussed it before, you know, because obviously we've, we've spoke to each other quite a lot recently to do with other things. And, um, and I'm thinking yesterday there was a feature on Radio Sheffield and there was a, a woman called Angie who called in who was saying her, her fuel bills were £160 a month and were just about to go up to £460 a month. And there's also rumours that in April that, that they'll double again. So, you know, triple in one year, double this spring. And, um, and that there's... While there is a, a commitment to addressing the climate emergency in the HRA plan, there is no commitment to using renewable energy. And, um, and, I, and I actually think that given the, the prices of fuel at the moment, that it is actually irresponsible to be installing gas heating systems in, in our homes. Um, and whereas renewable energy, of course, is not only uh, will, will tackle the problems of fuel poverty, but also fuel resilience. So if Russia turned the tap off, it doesn't matter to us, we can still heat our homes. Um, and also, um, in, in relation to that, the, the community um, energy systems that, you know, how creative can we be and, and, and progressive with our 
community heating systems and using geothermal or whatever and um, and then selling that energy at a, a fairer cost to our tenants so I, I think there's a sort of question in there but I'm not I, I'm not it's kind of a comment with a little bit of a, a question mark at the end thanks so, Janet thank you Paul I think it's yeah. do you agree Janet really is the panel but yeah uh, Yes, I did. I would just like to, to confirm that we are looking at um, and have been testing out some new technologies within the stock. Um, and that is to make sure that we can understand the implications of those new technologies. Um, and that's on the basis of the, the cost of introducing them, but also customer benefits from those. Um, but one of the things that we we do need to do is make sure that we do the proper research and that intelligence to look at those those technologies so we are not sat back not not investing in different models but we're also making sure that they will work for the council housing livestock i i certainly would want to recommend that when we bring forward what the roadmap to net zero for residential homes in the city might need to look like um, is that maybe we could provide some information about what the council is already doing with regard to its its distribution networks and renewables um, as part of that report Thank, thanks if there's no more comments I, I, I just got a question and then a comment to then I will move. so the question is um, and it would be remiss of us not to ask it bearing in mind that most councillors get their post bags full of the repairs situation that we are in in Sheffield. And bearing in mind the massive amount, I think it's 40 million we put in on our, by our day to day repairs. Can you bring the COP exec up to date where we are with the repairs? And I, you know, we are under a review as well. So could you kind of just bring us up to date, Jack, where we are at this moment in time? Yes, certainly. So um, a considerable amount of work has been done, um, you know, by, by the repair service and also working, um, you know, across the council to look at how we improve the repair service. So um, there is, there is a, a transformational programme to improve repairs. Um, and, you know, and that is included replacing its IT system, looking at different ways of delivering the repair service and also changing um, how on a day to day basis the repair service um, is managed. That will take some time. That's not an overnight thing. Um, and that is also will take some time to implement all of those changes. But certainly we are seeing the signs of some really good early work and outcomes for customers as part of that service. One of the things that we do have um, is that there is a backlog of work, um, you know, through obviously not being able to deliver the full range of services due to the pandemic. So we know every property that is missing work that should have been done or was previously ordered and working and, you know, we are working closely with, with Nathan Rogers and his management team or delivering, you know, all, all the hard work on the repair service to get that backlog uh, carried out. What we will be doing um, when we get to year end is reviewing how much of that backlog still remains and also um, how much of the works obviously we can that's out, that's outstanding that we need to do um, that should be as part of you know maybe some planned work programs rather than, than through a day-to-day -day repairs um, program of work of activity and we hoping that that might enable us to be able to complete the backlog and also to make sure that we are bringing forward uh, the capital program works to relieve pressure on the repair service as well. So that's that's a, a, a joint collaborative piece of work that we are doing um, and hopefully uh, we should then be able to see better outcomes for customers but it is incredibly important uh, for customers at the moment that any works that they are waiting for that they are done as quickly as possible. Th th thanks for that Jenna. I just kind of want to finish off with a comment to thank you and the team. I know how hard it is year on year and certainly over the last two years with this pandemic trying to provide a service to, to our residents. I want to pass them thanks on to yourself and, and to the team. I'd also like to 
welcome, if you want, the independent living schemes that we are delivering across the city, and, and one obviously in Buchanan, where we are, and a individual uh, um, properties in, in there, which is fantastic for the city. But I'd also like to say that, and, and we've heard today about the climate change and, and the real pressures that our families across all of this city are facing, and it's great to hear that we are increasing this hardship fund, even though the challenges we face. And my understanding is we're going to and we invest over £53 million in these changes to, towards making our homes warmer and fit for purpose. The issue, I think, what we have is also we've got to take everybody with us on this journey. That, I think that is becoming quite clear to us, that we really need to take people along with us on, on this. And for me, the most important is for those people is what they see outside their window and the homes they live in where they work, live and play in those communities and, and it, I welcome, obviously, in the HR, the, the amount of work we're going to do on our estates as well. So, thank you for that. Um, I look forward, this is obviously going to full council, so we await for that debate, which should be quite uh, interesting. Uh, can I thank members? I think it's been really interesting and I think to some of, you know, part of this HRA is on our trip down, down our community wealth building route, I think. We, we, whether it's circular donors or whatever we're calling it, but it's a real opportunity. And as Kate, Councillor Kate McDonald has said about the apprentices and how we're kind of moving that forward is fantastic. So, with the recommendations we've got at this moment in time that's to the Corp Exec, can we agree those and then send them through to full council, where obviously we'll debate, debate this uh, issue again? Uh, all those, uh, can we agree that? Uh, agree? Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Janet. Please send the next officer in, please. Welcome, Jane. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. I haven't seen each other in person for a while. Would you like to re uh, introduce yourself and then introduce the report, please? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Jane Clark from Finance and, Finance and Commercial Services at, at the Council. Uh, I'm here to, to introduce the report on the uh, refinancing of the Howden House PFI contract. Uh, so just kind of by way of a background, uh, Howden House PFI contract, like all PFI contracts, is... Uh, based on funding that's borrowed from a, a bank or investment fund at, at an interest rate that's fixed at the start of the contract and is fixed in for the, the duration of that contract. And that debt is repaid to the annual contract payments that the council makes. Um, and the interest rate that's fixed is based on the particular risk profile of the contract and the, how competitive the, the funding market is at, at the time. But it is possible through the life of the contract to, to refinance that debt. So to, to cancel the existing debt, pay off the existing funder or funders and replace with, with funders offering more competitive terms. So we've, we've explored the potential of a refinance in the, in the current uh, funding market for, for Houghton PFI. And, it, and it's believed that we can achieve more competitive terms um, We've done some, some market testing and the, the indications from that market testing are that we, there is 
interest at, at really competitive rates at the moment. Um, the, the, what the budget, what the report is asking for is to, is to take the, the, uh, the refinancing forward uh, so that we uh, reduce, reproduce a, a refinance gain that will reduce the cost uh, of the contract to the council. Um, and we've also agreed a, a sharing methodology with the, with the contractor. Um, and, and that share of the refinancing gain will contribute to addressing some of the council's budgetary pressures. The refinance uh, will also have to be approved by the Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities, as they are the sponsoring department for the, for the contract. And we've already engaged with them um, in terms of their, their requirements and, and their approval process. So the, the report kind of sets out more detail in terms of the background to, to the contract, the, the, the steps we've taken so far, and the, the next steps that, we're, that, that need to be taken to, to get to a, a, a satisfactory conclusion. And what we're asking for is, is approval to, to continue that refinance process, uh, select a, uh, a potential new funder, and uh, agree terms that, that maximise the savings for the council. Uh, and to take that forward to, uh, to, through to a preferred uh, and, and solution and a, a to financial close. We also need to uh, continue the ongoing dialogue with uh, the Department of Leveling Up through that refinance process and will ultimately submit a business case to them for their approval. Um, and also as, as part of the process, as we've been in discussions with, uh, with the contractor, we've also explored the, the possibility of uh, further savings from uh, the energy savings related to the, to the contract. So at the, the moment, the, the methodology for sharing of, of the consumption risk and energy is, is very much kind of skewed in the favour of, of the contractor. So it was set uh, based on uh, estimates of consumption right at the start of the contract that have actually turned out to be quite a bit higher than, than reality. So at the moment, the contract is benefiting from that under consumption. Um, but, we've all, but we've engaged with them, we've had quite um, good discussions with them and, and they're prepared to offer a, a, a revision to that gain share mechanism that will result in us, us getting a, a share of those savings. And so, and, and, and further we're asking for, for approval therefore to take that forward um, and vary the, the contract accordingly to, to introduce that new methodology. And just to kind of wrap up, just to say that in both cases, what we're asking for is for uh, changes to the contract that won't change the services delivered to the citizens of Sheffield. This is just about making the contract more affordable in, in the current market. That, thank, thanks, Ian. Thanks for the report. Any questions? I think it's quite straightforward. Or comments? If not, can we agree that? Oh, so, oh, sorry. sorry. Okay. No, thanks. I was just going to chair. I was just going to say thanks to Jane for the work, and, and it's really good when we can make some savings that don't impact on the quality of services and so on. So thanks for all the work, and try and find some more, please. <laughs> right. Thanks, everyone. I think you pointed to turn that off, Jane. But thank, right. thank, thanks, Jane, and see you soon. Sure we'll get there. Th thanks, everyone. Can we can we agree those recommendations? Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.
Hi, Laurie. If you want to um, introduce yourself, then introduce the report. That'll be fine. Thank you. Thanks, Terry. Um, so my name's Laura Hayfield. I'm from the Employment and Skills Service. I'm here to talk to you about the ESF Pathways projects um, and seek approval to continue with those projects to accept the extension of the funds we've been offered to continue as the accountable body um, and to procure and award the services required from the voluntary and community sector. Ambition and Pathways to Success are ESF projects that are awarded through the Department of Work and Pensions and they aim to help those furthest from the labour market and those with complex barriers to help them to become closer to and into the labour market. The projects seek to have particular focus on groups shown to have been disproportionately affected in terms of employment by COVID, for instance, those with physical and learning disabilities, ex-offenders, and young people who are lone parents and care leavers, to name but a few. This is a, they are regional projects that cover Sheffield, Rotherham, Doncaster and Barnsley, with Sheffield as the lead accountable body. Since the 1920 financial year, the programmes have engaged with over 5,000 people across the region, with 2,500 of those going into employment or further education or training. In Sheffield, it's engaged with 3,127 residents um, and nearly 1,500 of those have gone into employment and training so far, with many more to be achieved and the evidence collected up until March 22. Due to the excellent performance of the projects, we were invited to apply for an extension. Local authorities are able to put in funds to lever in 60% more funds via the European Social Fund. This has been successful and a, a, an extension granted until December 23. For Pathways to Success, this means a further regional investment in employment of skills of 2.8 million, with 1.93 million of that for Sheffield. For Ambition, regionally, it's an additional investment in employment and skills of 3.14 million regionally, with 2.7 million of that for Sheffield. In Sheffield, it will also allow us to grant 1.65 million um, pounds worth of employment and skills service to the voluntary and community sector. And these will be for employment projects to be delivered in the community. So as I say, it's just to try and get uh, approval for those recommendations. Thank, thank, thanks, Laura. Any questions? Jane? Thank you. Thank you. I welcome anything that is skills and investment in. I've got a couple of questions. Um, really good stats here. Um, I presume that the DWP get the stats. It would be. Re I would like to know where the jobs and investment have been and what the breakdown is across Sheffield. Um, I know that uh, I know I'm well aware how um, they work and how we don't have a lot of time to shape this, but I would like to know how we have shaped these schemes in Sheffield because uh, I mean obviously I represent Saudi Ward and this is something that I'm really, really keen on through the lacks is working and actually filtering the money that comes down from South Yorkshire Mayoral into the streets of the community and how do we actually shape that? So I would like to know how we how we will in future have opportunity to do that because you just said that that is going to extend to 2023 and how with our care leavers as well we can access that just so that it really really do it because i think so much happens yet local councillors and communities don't realize how that is happening and i'm aware i know what they've done in the past how they've given basically deadlines of like six weeks for you to put bids in but it's really important that we as a council are developing those pathways so when opportunities come down like this we can access them straight away so it's not a criticism on that it's more to do with how do we actually work on that and I would like to know if we could have that data I don't expect you to be able to give it me now but it would be really great that we could then sing really highly look at what's happening in our communities and this is why thank you um, 
Okay, so the funds were brought in by um, bidding, so we were able to look at our requirements in terms of our demographics within the city, as I say, focusing some of that work on those who have been disproportionately affected, and um, we, we do have statistics in Sheffield to show that we have um, poor performance in terms of uh, long-term unemployed people um, getting into work. So we've been able to, to really shape that. And what there is um, out there at the moment in Sheffield is quite a lot of sort of generic employment and skills support um, via various projects that have come out to help people closer to the labour market. So very much the procurement strategy for this round is to really focus on those harder to reach groups, which I mentioned as, as part of it. Um, we've also done some analysis of the performance in the first part of the, the contract from 2019. And I'm pleased to say that the statistics show that we really do show we really hit those areas of multiple deprivation and um, that score in, in, in the indices of multiple deprivation as, as the most deprived and um, more so than, than the other areas of Sheffield. We've done some analysis by ward and neighbourhood to show the impact that we're having in those different uh, neighbourhoods and wards. And I'm able to, to circulate that to you afterwards if that's helpful. So you said shaping, absolutely fine at our level, because I know, you know, but how are ward councillors able to shape or feed in as we're coming out of the pandemic, what is needed? I'm just thinking about um, some people in my ward, you know, as we all do. So it's just how can we go and shape that through the lacks, I think would be the best way, because then we come collectively. Yeah. So, um, for instance, we've been and met with the South LAC recently uh, and been able to present some of this and get some of their, their feedback and input into the way in which we'll be spending that money in their area. And uh, uh, I've got a workshop this evening, actually, with the South LAC to, to further shape that. And I know there's some particular focus um, in that, um, that uh, local area committee around Gleadless. Um, and Sharrow and, and Netheredge in particular. Um, we're then due to go and see the other local area committees and a number of have, have put employment and skills as one of their um, priorities for their uh, local area committee areas. Uh, and so we're looking really for those to input and shape some of, of those. And Kate will attest to the fact that I, I've been to her local area committee and she's, she's been able to shape some of, of that for her ward. The, the other thing I just wanted to mention, because you mentioned care leavers, um, is that there's the Apollo project was a, a really successful care leaver project that's just come to an end that was supported through the Department for Education. We've been able to work with the delivery partner for that, Sheffield Futures, to put a proportion of these um, pathways projects to lone parents and care leavers. Um, with Sheffield Futures so that they can support us by delivering specifically for that group. Thank, thanks, Paul. Uh, cheers. Terry, uh, Laura, thanks very much for doing this and, and getting it over the line. And I know it was quite, uh, there were some time constraints, weren't there? But you've done it. Brilliant. Um, so I don't really have any questions, and uh, but I just wanted to say that, um, you know, it's just really valuable piece of work that's going to help people into work and upskill them. And, you know, I, I just can't get over that the Sheffield really struggles with the average wages, you know, the lowest average wage for women in the core cities, second lowest average wage for men in the core cities. And it's things like this that, that we need to address that. And, um, and also, I just want to acknowledge that I'm really uh, proud of Sheffield, acknowledging it's significant position in um, South Yorkshire and, and playing such a, a leading role in this by being the responsible body. So yeah, thanks very much again, Laura, and um, yeah, well done. Th th thanks, Paul, and Laura Tenna, thanks back for yourself to the team as well. On the report, no more comments. We've got the recommendations. Can we agree the recommendations? Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Laura.
Hi, Jamie. Um, if you'd like to introduce yourself and then introduce the report, please. Hi, uh, yeah, I'm Damien Watkinson. I'm the uh, finance manager in the capital and construction team. Um, I attend each month to bring the variations and changes to the capital programme uh, that need to be approved at COP exec level. Um, it's a slightly longer report than usual this month, because uh, in addition to the usual items, I've got a couple of uh, appendices um, re relate to um, the housing um, capital programme, which you've already had a briefing on, and also i uh, bring you something on uh, uh, major slippage this month as well. So I'll take them slightly out of order. I'll just take the appendix three first. So this is summarising the changes to the housing capital programme for the next five years as a result of the uh, HRA business plan, which uh, Janet presented earlier. Um, and from the capital side, um, that's showing um, over the next five years an additional £167 million um, pounds of investment um, largely that's in allocations at the moment, so you know, for themes and the individual projects will then come through this process um, as and when they're developed in order to, uh, to get on to uh, delivery. Um, so the, the majority of that is uh, being built, made up of um, the, well, the key elements are the, the increase in the stock increase programme and, uh, and the allocations that have been made for uh, heating and energy efficiency. So they're the big increases there, but like I said, Janet took you through that in quite some some detail earlier. Um, the Appendix 2, which is the other slightly different one, it summarises some major reprofiling and slippage across the rest of the programme, so everything really outside the housing one. Um, I think it's fair to say that it's been a really, it's been a really challenging year for construction, and um, in paragraph 1.4 in the main report, we sort of outline some of the reasons around that around COVID and Brexit. And that's really impacted significantly on supply chains and contractors and even our own resources, you know, our own staff have been off, which is, uh, has been difficult. So it's just bringing through, there's approximately 40 million new investment that's moving into later years. So we're just bringing, I'll bring those through because um, we've like, reviewed the whole capital programme and just want to allocate, make sure those budgets are allocated correctly now. So we brought that uh, at this stage as well. Um, so if I get back onto what's usual, the, 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 the new items, so on the regular approvals, I'll not go through every one, but um, key ones are the Town Hall Square animation we've got coming forward, which is looking to put a temporary event space um, to complement the future High Street Funds works. Um, that's, we're asking for a delegation on that one because we're just still finalising funding around that from, uh, from the combined authority. So um, on that item, they the ask for a delegation um, to officers to progress that once the funding's available and confirmed. Um, under housing growth, We've got two major stock increase program uh, schemes coming forward. There's 8.4 million for the purchase of 47 new houses uh, from the housing company at Corker Bottoms, and uh, 5.4 million uh, to develop ourselves, the former Ball Hill care home site, to deliver 36 new two bedroom departments. Um, on the people side, we've got coming forward um, feasibility works on schools in the southwest to, to look at um, the cost of expansion in that area. Um, and one of them relates to, uh, I think it's Appendix 5, because uh, the Chorus Trust are delivering that themselves, so we'll be passporting the money to them. So part of the approvals on this is to passport some of that money over to the Trust um, to deliver that. Um, appendix 4, then, is, is our chance to accept grants. So we've got uh, several coming forward this month. We've been offered some gain share funding from the combined authority to start work on the Sheaf and Porter flood alleviation scheme. So to start doing the detailed uh, feasibility work on that. I'm expecting the business case for the actual spend on that to come forward in the next couple of, uh, couple of cycles. Um, but the offer of that funding has been made and it's a chance to accept that now. Um, the other ones, we've got three... Um, let me just check. Yeah, three uh, Transforming Cities Fund awards. So these are uh, staged payments that again coming from the combined authority. So they relate to the uh, Atcliffe and Darnell scheme, Magna Tinsley and Netheredge Wedge. These are all about uh, developing active travel and improving public transport access. Um, these are what they term stage two payments. So these are to get us through to putting in a final business case to the combined authority to unlock the big money as it were. So we're going to be looking at you know, tens of millions as part of that. But this, these allocations are for 1.2, 1.3, 900k at the moment. And like I said, that's, that's to develop those larger schemes and unlock that, uh, that bigger funding. 
uh, to get to that last stage. And yes, the grants to issue, what I, I did mention earlier, that relates to the South West Schools passing some money to the Chorus Trust to continue that feasibility to develop the costs on expanding those places in the, in the South West of the city. Um, I see that as the key element, so happy to take any questions on anything or anything that I've not specifically mentioned that you'd like to ask me about. Thank, thanks, Damien. Okay. Thank you, Damien. You're not lucky last today. We've got a bit long agenda. <laughs> um, I just wanted to, um, to ask you to say a bit more about the reason for the slippage, uh, because obviously none of us like to see slippage in our, our programmes, and, and, and obviously that's something which people might be critical of. So perhaps you could just say a bit more about the reason for that and, and, and the, the factors in particular that are outside the council's control. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's been, you know, specific examples I can think of are, like, you know, with, like deliveries, literally the, the, getting, this, getting the materials through for, for instance, the Greater Green uh, set, uh, uh, project we've got going on, granite coming from Portugal, getting held up, that holds up, you, get, you, get, you know, you can't deliver that scheme, you know, the costs increase on it, and it, it creates difficulties. We've had contractors go bust on major flood development schemes, so down at the Upper Don, uh, sorry, yeah, the Upper Don Valley scheme, Actually, and the load of Valley, you know, both contractors went into administration on there. So it's, it's, it's that, and, the, and also it's the pent-up um, demand in the market for, for everything to be delivered after the pandemic. You know, everybody is now trying to access all the same resources. Um, but, you know, and then you have, again, the next wave and, um, you know, the, the ability to deliver reduced, uh, reduced again. Uh, and then on top of that, it's, there's also been the issues around, you know, the changing of compliance regulations um, due to our leaving Europe. So we're now moving towards, I think it's UK, UK, I've got it in my report, and, and my screen's gone blank, sorry, but, you know, different standards that we're working to now. Um, and that changeover, you know, it just takes more time. And we've seen schemes that go out to tender and come back, you know, at significantly higher than the estimated budget. So. You know, we'd look, you'd look at, have we got sufficient resources to deliver, or do we have to go back out to tender and all these things just extend the process? Which, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a really challenging year again. People thought after last year, this year will get easier. And, and maybe in some cases, you know, we, we were optimistic and bullish about, oh, you know, we'll be able to get moving again. But it's just not been the case. And I think it's, it's been a case of maybe, you know, almost being too optimistic, trying to deliver too much this year. Um, so just trying to put that back on, you know, taking stock of what's happened nationally, internationally, and then saying, you know, this is locally how it's going to affect us is let's try and be a bit more realistic about how we can deliver that and get those budgets right so we can start to monitor against them more effectively. Thank you. I would always encourage um, us to be ambitious, but yep. we have to be a bit re realistic in terms of the current climate, don't we? Thank you. Thanks. Any more questions, comments? If not, can I? Oh, do you want? Thank you. It's um, just a comment on the, um, the the very first item to the containers at the top of Fargate. I just think that's a fantastic idea. We are the steel city. I think it's a great way to um, celebrate that. Um, it is temporary, so it can be used elsewhere. But I also understand, and it would just be helpful if you can confirm, please, Damien, that um, there was an issue about lack of public toilets in the city centre and that this container unit will also address that issue as well. Thank you. Well, I don't have detail on that, but I'll check that with the, with the pro, a project manager and uh, just make sure what's expected from that. Thanks, Julie. Douglas? Following off, I just want my hand up to ask about the toilet as well. Um, because a really important thing, yeah, definitely welcome <laughs> Welcome this um, on Fargate, but yeah, it'd be really good to uh, to um, find out if we can go to the toilet on the top of Fargate. Um, it's something that's been uh, bogging people. The, the other question I've got on that is, um, just, what, what, just kind of what's the issue on the delegation? Are we saying that we're being asked to approve something we've not got money to do, or, or what? What's what's the issue there? Yeah, sorry, it's, uh, it's subject to, so we're just waiting for the confirmation of the funding from the combined authority. Now, that wasn't received in time to ask you guys now to say, accept it, let's go ahead. So we're just asking for that delegation that once we do get that offer, we, it's delegated to officers to accept it. 
and you carry on with the scheme. So it's like I say, if, if we've got the offer, and that's what I'd just be saying now, so it's a bit the usual, can you approve this grant, can, you, can we progress this scheme, but unfortunately the offer's just not quite received from, F, uh, from Combined Authority yet. It's expected this later this month, so that, that's a reason for that one. Thanks, well, that seems fine to me. Thank, thanks everyone. If, if everybody's got no more comments or questions, can I just make two, two comments, if I can, Damien? Obviously on page 160, on the slip, one of the schemes is forged down. Uh, me and Councillor Julie Grocott was out there on our walkabouts, as everybody knows I've been doing the walkabouts around the city. Um, we're well over halfway around all the wards, and I'd like to thank the Friends Group of, of Forged Dam, and especially Anne for taking us round, round there and talking to toilets. We'd been round all day, and then taking us at Forged Dam and water was quite challenging at that moment in time. Um, but I'd also like to thank uh, Councillors Angus, Anger, Sue Alston, and Cliff Woodcraft for, for, for the welcome we got uh, uh, around on that tour. So I, we saw the intensity of the work in that Forge Dam, but also what we could feel by the people who were there with the warmth of all that project right down that valley. And the work that we're doing as a council is absolutely uh, welcomed by, by all that we talk to. And, and, and me and Councillor Grocock uh, talked to a number of just residents who were passing through, and so they welcomed. Uh, but we, we understood the, the challenges that it is happening in and the type of machinery to, to, to reinstate that. Um, and also, obviously, I, I'd like to, to welcome the 8.4 million to Coker Bottoms in my ward, the investment that's going in there for those 47 dwellings actually to open that up to, to bring that to life and also the five point odd million at Bowles. It just shows our commitment that you know we are trying to meet the housing need and furthering the agenda we've got the local plan which we'll be discussing about. So I'd just like to put on, 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 on record my welcome and thanks for that. Um, we've got the recommendations with the delegation which now has been explained to us. Can we agree those? If we can, thank you. Is the, I think we've been at this two hours and we've got three kind of chunky items. I'm hoping, I, I don't know, should we just take a 10 minute comfort break? Is that, is everybody okay with that? Okay, okay. Thanks ever so much, thanks Damien. We'll just take a 10 minute comfort break if that's fine. Thank you. Thank, thank you everyone uh, for, that, for that break. We're now on item 15. Uh, Ryan, would you like to introduce yourself and introduce the report, please? Thank you. Thanks, Chair. My name is Ryan Keemus. I'm the Council's Director of Finance and Commercial Services. This report's about appointing a chair to the TREE inquiry. Uh, the cooperation agreement that followed the 2021 uh, May elections included a requirement to appoint an independent person to conduct a local non-statutory inquiry into the management of the street trees dispute. Uh, following that agreement, I was asked to, to establish and set up that inquiry. The report in front of you today sets out what's been done to fulfill that requirement since that agreement was made and recommends an appointment of a chair for that inquiry. Um, the work we've done to date to set it up uh, essentially involves appointing independent legal advisors to, to the inquiry, holding uh, a few public meetings to talk to stakeholders about the inquiry and running a selection process to appoint the chair. Uh, following that process, Sir Mark Lowcock is recommended as, as chair to the inquiry. Uh, we advertised nationally during the autumn of last year and final interviews took place uh, last week for the shortlisted candidates. Uh, the final interview process included both officer and member panels and uh, in each of the shortlisted candidates actually took part in a question and answer session with a range of stakeholders, members of the public and other interested parties who, who have an interest in the inquiry. If the report is approved, uh, we will conclude our contracting arrangements between the Council and, and Mark Lowcock to conduct the inquiry, and he'll then commence work on putting the inquiry's uh, terms of reference together. Uh, his intention and our requirement of him is that he consults with all stakeholders to the inquiry as part of the process of uh, putting the terms of reference together, but the intention is that he is responsible for signing off those terms of reference in, in order to ensure that the inquiry has the independence that the executive require of it. Um, so this report also includes a very high level cost estimate for the inquiry, uh, which we will be in a position to firm up once those terms of reference have been put together. Thank you, Chair. That, that, thanks, Ryan. Julie? 
Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd just like to say thank you to Ryan and the team for all the hard work that's gone into this over the last few months. Um, we all know that this is a very sensitive area for lots of people, so um, the way that it's been dealt with, I'm extremely grateful for. I'd also like to think, thank everyone um, across the city who has engaged with us and say that I look forward to this being a um, constructive um, inquiry. I think we've got the right person um, appointed to do the job and hopefully we will be able to um, get to a sensible end to um, this matter once the inquiry is concluded. So thanks Ryan very much for all your support and hard work with this. Thanks Julie. Any more questions? Douglas? Thanks. Just briefly to echo uh, what Julie has said, um, I think that it's already been a, an interesting and useful process involving a lot of the people who are quite heavily involved with the campaign in one capacity or another. So I think the main things I'd like to say is that it's been a good process so far. It's absolutely the right decision. So primarily thanks to all the people who have been involved, um, uh, Ryan and, and others, um, and also congratulations to the uh, successful applicant who I think will be a very good and a very interesting um, uh, addition to uh, Sheffield's activity. Thank, thanks, Douglas. Any more questions, comments? Okay. Comment. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm, I'm happy with the um, uh, to agree the candidate, uh, the proposal and so on. And again, thank you everybody for the work that's been put into it. I'm just conscious that we haven't had an opportunity to discuss this before this point. And, and personally, because of my responsibilities, I'm very anxious about the budget. Uh, not specifically this budget, the whole of the council's budget at the moment. So I just wonder whether it would be possible for us to bring back another paper once the terms of reference have been agreed so that we can uh, fully understand the financial implications of the process. Because we can't do that at this point because the terms of reference haven't, haven't yet been agreed. So that's, that's my only comment, but I'm, I'm, I have no problems at all. It sounds like uh, the candidates are very, a very interesting background and can bring a lot to the, um, to the process and, and I will watch it with interest. But I'd just like to have um, further information and discussion about the financial implications in view of the Council's budget at the moment. Thank you. Th 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 thanks, Kate. Uh, I've got Paul first, then Douglas, and then come bring Julie. Paul? Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I don't think it probably needs saying, as it's already been said, but I'm going to say it anyway. Thanks very much, Ryan. I'm really looking forward to this inquiry. I, I think it's, been, it's going to be an essential part of the Council continuing to build trust with the public, and I, I really look forward to the outcome, and, and honestly, thanks very much for your, your work and um, what you've done so far. Thank, thank you, Paul. Douglas? Thanks for saying that. I think Kate's um, suggestion of bringing it back here is a good one and um, it will be, I think, quite really useful to have um, the executive or whatever body it is then um, informed once the terms of reference are established uh, and as we make clear, it's very firmly in the hands of the chair to um, drive the terms of reference but we'll certainly need to know about it and yeah, it'd be good to refer it back. Thank you. Uh, th thanks, Douglas. Uh, Julie? Thank you, Chair. I was just going to say, if Kate wants to put that through as a, a, a recommendation, I'm happy to second that. Thank, thanks, everyone. Uh, can I thank everybody, everyone involved in this, and, and thank you, Ryan, and, and, and certainly the team that's in it. You know, this is a major plank in our cooperative agreement, which, uh, and I thank Douglas and, and Alison in respect of when we was discussing a way forward for this cooperative executive to get to this point. But I also want to put on record thanks to uh, my deputy, Julie Gilcock, to navigate this through with um, um, taking everybody along on this, the stakeholders, the individuals and, 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 and with officers. So if you can pass our thanks to, 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 to yourself and, and your team and, and, and to the uh, congratulations to the, to the new chair in respect. We look forward to seeing them in terms of conditions. Um, Kip, uh, Councillor MacDonald has put a recommendation. We've got a second uh, just to add to them recommendations. I, you know, I, I really kind of um, want this to move on. It will be another uh, delivery of our uh, commitment as a cooperative executive that we set out those six major bullet points. Uh, and to get this over the line, I think is uh, um, two cheers out of three so far. Uh, thanks ever so much. Uh, Councillor MacDonald. Uh, would you like me to 
just suggest a form of words. Um, it's fairly straightforward um, that the corporate sector, just to add to the two that are already there, agree that there will be a further paper to the cooperative executive that details the financial implications of the terms of reference once they have, these have been developed by the independent chair and agreed with stakeholders. Second, second, are you comfortable with that? Yeah, we, we, and let's get the process off and running. Yeah, all, all those agreed, uh, comfortable. Right, let's get this off and running. Thanks, thanks, Douglas, and thanks everyone for that. Um, what, what will we wait for the next officer? Um, we've got the item, oh, right, okay, the local plan. Okay, thank you, uh, uh, thank you, Michael. And can you introduce yourselves and the, the paper, um, and then we'll kind of crack on. So we're on the Sheffield Local Plan Spatial Options, uh, item 16. Michael. Chair, sure, thank you. Um, so we're here to just to have a conversation today about the Local Plan Spatial Options. Um, that follows Simon and I sitting with the Transitional Committee last Thursday. Um, we had a session, I think, that lasted for around about three hours last Thursday, and that came off the back of us having three workshops with the transitional committee in advance of that meeting. Um, Simon is going to talk through um, the, the issue in a bit more detail with a, a bit of a statement that should last for about five minutes, um, just to make sure that the issues are covered. Um, essentially, at the end of the transitional committee last week, there was a vote um, by the members of the transitional committee cross-party around five spatial options for the local plan. Um, the preference of the transitional committee um, with five members voting for this option was option three. And in a nutshell, and Simon will, will expand on the nutshell shortly, um, option three is essentially utilising Sheffield's urban brownfield um, utilising some of previously undeveloped land within Sheffield's urban area and utilising a limited number of large brownfield sites in the Greenbelt as the spatial approach for the local plan moving forward. All of that will be subject to environmental checks at the next stage of the process through a, through a, site, selection, um, through a site selection process. Um, while we're here today, Chair, and as agreed at sort of previously as part of this process, we're here with two recommendations today. The first recommendation is for the cooperative executive to note the advice of the transitional committee that they supported option three as the preferred option of the five options that were discussed last week. The second recommendation today is for the transitional, it's, oh, I knew I'd do that, sorry, Chair, for the cooperative executive, <laughs> um, is for the cooperative executive to, re to refer today's report um, to full council and ask full council to offer a view on whether option three is the option the full council wishes to move forward with or whether one of the other four options is the preferred option of full council. 
ahead of a final decision being taken on the right option, on what the right option will be ultimately at the cooperative executive in February. So, so that's me, Chair, and I'll just hand over to Simon just to um, just to, to, to delve into the detail a little bit more. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Um, so yeah, we thought it would be useful just to introduce um, the report in a little bit more detail. Um, so the report, as Michael says, relates to the production of Sheffield's local plan, what we're calling the Sheffield Plan. And as Michael says, the purpose of the report is to set out the overall spatial options for meeting future development needs in, the, in Sheffield in the period to 2039. And it's 2039 because we expect the plan to be adopted in, in 2024, and the plan has to look 15 years ahead. Uh, the aim is for the council and ultimately the cooperative executive to reach agreement on a preferred approach in advance of producing uh, the publication draft Sheffield plan which we're aiming to publish for public consultation in October this year. This process of looking first at the spatial options was agreed by the cooperative executive in October last year uh, when a revised timetable for, for, for producing the local plan was agreed onto the local development scheme. This stage of agreeing the overall spatial approach um, is not part of the statutory local plan process, but we felt it was necessary to try and build a political consensus uh, about what the best overall approach is in terms of providing land uh, for jobs, housing and other uses. We felt this approach was necessary um, largely because of a significant change to government policy uh, that was made in December 2020. Uh, when the government changed its methodology for calculating uh, future housing need. When we consulted on the uh, Sheffield plan issues and options uh, in autumn 2020, uh, the government's methodology at that time was indicating uh, we would need uh, to build around 40,000 homes in Sheffield over the period uh, to 2039. We felt at that time that that was a reasonable uh, approach because it aligned with the city's jobs growth aspirations uh, uh, as set out in the city region's strategic economic plan. The change to the methodology uh, in December 2020 means that the housing need figure uh, has increased uh, by 35% uh, to over 53,500 homes. This urban uplift uh, was applied uh, to London and the 19 other la largest urban centres in England. The government would no doubt note that this supports their levelling up agenda and prioritises uh, brownfield development. But what it does mean is that it implies a significant level of migration to Sheffield from other parts of the UK and from abroad. And I think we have to question whether that's going, going to be realistic. I think it's worth saying that the housing need figure that the government calculates, what, what is sometimes referred to as the objectively assessed need, is the starting point for setting the housing requirement tar or target in the Sheffield plan. However, the expectation in the national planning policy framework is that the objectively assessed housing need uh, will be met in full. So as I say, that's the figure calculated using the government's uh, standard methodology. However, we can set um, a different figure if there's good evidence to show why the government's figure should not be met, and if doing so would harm assets identified in the national planning policy framework as being of particular importance. And the, and the MPPF lists things like the green belt and sites of special scientific interest. So if the harm would be caused to those assets, then that's a reason uh, for setting a, a lower housing requirement figure. Just very briefly, just to, to talk you through the options, um, the report sets out five spatial options for accommodating housing growth. The first four options are essentially capacity-led, and by that I mean that the housing requirement figure would be determined by the amount of land that, that is to be allocated under that particular option. Uh, so under option one, the, the requirement would be constrained by the supply of brownfield sites that are available. And in theory, uh, our analysis suggests that up to 37,300 homes could be provided on brownfield sites in the existing urban areas. Option two would involve developing some previously undeveloped land in the urban area, and paragraph 1.6.8 uh, defines uh, what we mean by that. Option three, as Michael mentioned, is, is the option favoured by the transitional committee, um, and that would mean developing two large uh, brownfield sites in the Greenbelt on the edge of the urban area, as well as the land uh, identified under options one and two. 
option four would mean, as well as options one to three, developing a limited number of greenfield sites in the green belt where there are site-specific exceptional circumstances to justify that release. Uh, that might be, for example, where it would, it would help support the viability of, of a railway line or opening new railway stations or to support, to support urban regeneration and the provision of new jobs. Option five would mean allocating enough land to meet the full housing need figure as calculated by the government. So we could describe that as the needs-led uh, option. For all the options, <coughs> the aim will be to maximise the potential of the central area of Sheffield to deliver new homes, and we expect about 20,000 new homes to be provided there by, by 2039. That's based on the analysis that's been undertaken to support the new city centre vision, which is currently the subject of a public consultation. I think there are strong uh, sustainability and economic arguments for seeking to maximise growth in the central area. It helps with reducing the need to travel, makes more efficient use of land, and importantly helps support the viability of shops and leisure uses uh, in the centre. Um, just before closing, I want to just highlight a few important points, I think, uh, for the executive and ultimately full council to, to bear in mind um, when thinking about what, what, what the preferred spatial option should be. The first is that the, the demographic analysis that we had commissioned uh, by ICENI projects um, indicates that between 1,994 and 2,323 additional homes are needed to support the city's jobs growth aspirations. So that's the, the jobs growth aspirations as set out in the strategic economic plan. And after allowing for um, a replacement of homes that we, would be lost through demolition uh, or conversion each year, a small number, about 50 a year, are lost that, that way. That would mean a total requirement of between 36,750 and 42,700 homes over the period 2021 to 2039. And I think the point to make here is that those figures are significantly lower than the, government, the, the figure the government is, is, is suggesting is needed. I think in deciding which option to recommend, um, the executive obviously needs to weigh up the benefits and disbenefits of each one, and those are set out in the report. Um, the other, thing to, other things to highlight are that, the, um, that, is that our exceptional circumstances are needed to justify altering the Greenbelt boundary. The Greenbelt is identified, as I say, in the MPPF as an asset of particular importance. So protection of the Greenbelt can, in principle, be used as a reason for not meeting the government's full housing uh, target. Uh, the question of whether exceptional circumstances exist is a matter of judgment and, again, is about weighing up the pros and cons. So, for example, releasing some Greenbelt land is likely to improve the choice of housing available and enable the city to provide more affordable homes. So there are social benefits uh, to that option. But this needs to be weighed against the harm to the environment, including the impact on the need to travel and carbon emissions. But also, if we don't provide enough homes in Sheffield to meet our needs, then that's likely to lead to greater commuting. And again, that has implications for carbon emissions uh, and the environment. I think another point to make is that we should seek to maximise the capacity of the urban areas before considering Greenbelt release, and the MPPF is very clear about that. That does mean using previously undeveloped land where it would not harm assets of particular importance or where it wouldn't conflict uh, with, with policies in the MPPF. So I think option two requires careful consideration. I think ruling it out at this stage carries significant risks in terms of getting the plan through uh, the public examination. And our recommendation, therefore, is that these matters should be considered through the detailed site selection process. Um, another point really is about employment land. We've got enough employment land to last till 2033, um, but there's an, an oversupply of poorer quality sites. The city would benefit uh, economically by providing more and better located sites for employment. Um, although we do expect additional supply to come forward within existing employment areas through windfalls and churn and changes within and redevelopment within those areas. I think choosing option one uh, would make it extremely challenging to sustain the levels of housing delivery the city needs. Many brownfield sites are challenging and costly to develop and it's questionable whether all the identified brownfield supply could actually be, be delivered by 2039. Choosing option five would mean we would also need to provide substantially more employment land in the city. So Greenbelt would need to be released for both employment uses and for housing, and that could result in about 7% of Sheffield's Greenbelt being de-designated, um, although a percentage of that land will be retained as, as open space. 
And finally, um, just a point to make is that whichever um, spatial approach has been agreed, there will be a process beyond this where we'll go through a, a, a site selection process whereby all relevant sites will be evaluated against a set of economic, social, and environmental criteria. That will enable us to produce a list of proposed allocated sites that fit the overall agreed spatial approach. Um, but it also means that some sites that fit that approach will be ruled out, for example, due to their impact on biodiversity or the risk of flooding. So I hope those points are, uh, are helpful uh, to the executive um, and, and ultimately to, to full council in, in considering which spatial options to go forward. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Simon. Mean, it, it is, and I know some exec members were sat on the transitional committee, so they've probably been through this quite a, quite a few, and, and, and we, we were. And I, I'd like to thank the team. I know this has been a long process to get to, and the, the added pressure of what the government has put us, knowing full well that a third of our land is in, is in the Peak District, is, is kind of, well, I won't use them words, but I think about it at this point in time. But we have a report in front of us. Is there any questions or comments to... Uh, my Lord Simon regarding this. Julie. Thank you. I know you've worked incredibly hard on this and I know it's been extremely difficult and certainly the government aren't helping is, is my view on that. Um, if I heard you correctly, just at the very end, Simon, you said that um, for jobs growth, the, um, it was expected that we'd need between 1,900 and 2,300 and something. Yeah. So by the government's own admission then, if we build the 53,000 houses what they want, they are expecting everybody who comes to Sheffield to take a job to have two homes in the city, is what they are saying, if you, if you, work, on their, if you work on their theory, which just shows you how nonsensical and how the lack of any strategic um, science has been be put behind the number that they have uplifted this city by. That just makes it an absolute nonsense. I think Councillor Fox is absolutely very clear. It would be interesting to know where in terms of exceptional circumstances having a third of the city in the Green Belt fits, because I think for me that is extremely um, important and relevant. You know, a lot of the city sits in the Green Belt. The rest of the city is surrounded by other large towns. So in terms of where we can grow the city size-wise, we just do not have that option. So it will be interesting to know, you know, where all of that sort of fits in terms of exceptional um, circumstances and what we can do about that. I just think it's extremely disappointing that, you know, we were so far down the path, we understood the housing numbers, we did, we've done lots of work, I say we, I mean you, have done lots of work and research in relation to housing, infrastructure, jobs. And, you know, the expert advice and planning that we have received does not tally with what feels like the government have done on the, the back of a fag packet, frankly. Um, they have uplifted our number, as you say, along with 19 other cities. What's happened to the rest of the country? Where, where are their housing numbers and expectations? You know, this is not about levelling up. This is just about overcrowding, frankly. And it's really, in my view, not fair to the um, people of Sheffield. And I'm sorry, that's a bit of a, a rant. It's a bit of an emotional response. And I think there might have been a couple of questions in there that I think you grab my feeling. I'll leave that with Michael to, 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 to cipher out that. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. I, I definitely wrote a few questions down. Um, I think, and, and Simon might want to come as well, but I think um, Councillor Groper just picked up in there around uh, we around the capacity-led approach, and, and I think this is the, the sort of the crux of the choices in front of us, really. Um, if 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 it was decided through this process that members didn't, and the right decision for Sheffield wasn't to, to meet the government's full target, and therefore release the land that would need to be released to, to, to meet that, then we need to we need to come up with a different approach, and so the letters that have been shared across with, with, with the Secretary of State and DLUC um, following the full council resolution at the end of last year, we were encouraged, if that's the right word, to sort of certainly 
go away and, and come back with an alternative approach if we didn't feel that, 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 that those numbers were right for us as a city. And ultimately, that alternative approach needs to be capacity-led. And what we do through these options, essentially, um, is we follow the hierarchy set out in the National Planning Policy Framework around Brownfield first, et cetera, to, to go through that capacity approach. Um, and, and what, one of the key considerations there is the, is the housing growth target in the, in the strategic economic plan at, at city region level. And, and actually, at, at, at what point do we start to provide the housing numbers that would support that e those economic ambitions? Because they are ambitions. It's, it, you know, they are ambitious targets. And that is the point where you start to then look at the next spatial option and say, well, if we if we've hit the target to hit, to meet our economic growth aspirations, actually, do do the pros outweigh the cons, or vice versa, to move to that next step? Now, as Simon picked up in the introduction. Part of that is, it, particularly if, if, if a, a decision is reached that exceptional circumstances don't exist, then that's a, that's a, a judgment call for, a dis, for the decision maker and, and ultimately that's you as members. If exceptional circumstances don't exist to, to release land in the green belt or only to release brownfield land in the green belt, such as option three, um, we need to we need to be comfortable and confident that, that we've maximised the, the capacity that we've got in our urban areas um, to make sure that we, that we follow that hierarchy and, and we've done all we can essentially before we get to that exceptional circumstances test within the green belt. Um, so that, that capacity-led approach is, is really key to what we're trying to do here and, and, and the pros versus cons as we work through each of the options with always with a mind to that sort of those economic and jobs growth aspirations. Now, that's not to say we can't come to a view or you can't come to a view as members that actually the, we should go beyond the strategic economic plan and that's something that you should weigh up in your considerations. But if the view is that that's the target and we've got an evidence base to show the housing numbers we need to hit that, then that's a key consideration when you go in through your pros and cons with each of the spatial options, but in particular when you're considering exceptional circumstances around Greenbelt release. The other elements to that, which the report talks about, it's not you know it's not as simple as, as as just those economic targets. It's the benefits that option two could potentially deliver, even if even if the numbers are limited associated with with option two. When you look at your social and environmental checks, that it it those options. The more we go through those options, including option four, which is is strategic greenbelt release, it gives us the ability to do things such as put different types of homes in different parts of the city that we would be constrained by if we chose just option one, for example, or option one and option two. So each option as you move through, there's significant benefits, but they do have to be weighed across what at times significant disbenefits, in particular around environmental harm. Um, the other question was the, the sort of the, the levelling up agenda and, and this approach, and is this really levelling up? And I think it's probably slightly, it's on topic, but sl slightly off piste in terms of this, this paper. But it is a really pertinent thing in terms of uh, in terms of strategic direction. And our view, and the view that we'd put back to government, whatever the outcome here, is that you know leveling up as a theme is something that we definitely support, and it's something that we we, we as as a city, I'm sure, want to want to to embrace as much as we can again whatever the white paper sort of says and defines leveling up what what we're saying really is that you can't you can't say right 35 percent and draw a line around sheffield city boundary it, it doesn't make any sense it's not a strategic approach and actually if you if you decided actually that the combined authority would get an uplift an evidence-based uplift based on uh, on economic growth that is this and, and allow us to take a strategic approach to delivering that across the city region and you mirror that across the country, then there's a, there's a, there's a real foundation to your approach. And, and I think that, that that's the point that I think Councillor Grocourt was, was picking up really, which is, you know, the as it's been drawn, a 35% uplift drawn around Sheffield's boundary sort of, doesn't seem to add up to, to the strategic approach that is followed by other things, including the, 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 the promotion of, the, of city regions and combined authorities, etc. Thanks, Chair. 
Th thanks, Mike. That, that was a great call of Dr. Jane and Paul. Uh, what I don't really do is want to rerun the transitional committee three hour debate, to be honest with you. I, I, you we are sending this to full council and it is coming back here. So if, if people have got certain comments or, or selling points they want, just on, on the information that we've got, um, it, 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 the transition committee was was a, a lengthy process of, of and, and well chaired by Councillor Mark Jones. So I don't want to stifle the bit, but I just don't want to stray into that transition, knowing full well that we're going to have two more bites at, at, at this cherry. So, uh, Jane? Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And Chair, I'm not going to open a debate, and Councillor Grocott said most of what I wanted to say. A, I welcome the recommendations to go to full council, and thank you both for all the, for the really detailed explanation. I wasn't at Transitional Committee, but as Ex-Chair of Planning, I do understand quite a lot of what's needed. And I think, Michael, you hit the nail on the head quite a lot about it needing a regional approach, especially since they've managed to withdraw all the investment on transport. So I think we do need to look at that. So, But I really welcome it going forward to full council. So that's what I wanted to support is that we do that, and that is definitely a better way of working. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Chair. Paul? Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm worried. I don't want to talk about the stuff that we have discussed in the, in the Transitional Committee. Douglas and I, as I sat on that committee, you know, when we've, we've lived and breathed this local plan, nowhere near as deeply as these fine men, obviously, but, you know, we, we've spent a lot of time in it. But I just wanted to note that... Um, while option three was the majority voted for with, at the um, committee, the, there was a uh, considerable acknowledgement that option four or something in between might uh, be more suitable. And, and of course, with option four, it, it gives more options as in the quality of housing. It also acknowledges that some urban green uh, field and green spaces could and actually do have a higher ecological and social value than some parts of the green belt and, and of course that means that those green spaces are where people live and that is essential you know um time is of the essence with the local plan and it's been way too long and, and every year as land is built on um that is land that cannot be put into the plan but it will not be taken off the plan's housing targets which of course, so the longer it goes on, the more difficult it is for us to squeeze these um, homes into the space we have in Sheffield. Um, and so I, I think what I just wanted to express was that with whatever option we choose, we, we have to give Michael and Simon something that they can argue for in government. I, I am yet to hear anybody who believes that the government uplift, 35% uplift is is uh, viable or even um, needed and the space that we have in Sheffield will be used up by building our own 40 something thousand target and and so if the government do want us to build an extra 35 percent I think we're going to have to start building castles in the sky which appropriately I've just looked up the definition dreams hopes or plans that are impossible and that really sums up the 35% uplift for me. So, uh, yeah, I'm sorry if I veered away from the, 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 the report, Chair, but uh, I just wanted to, to say those things. Thanks very much, and thanks, Michael and Simon. Uh, thank, th thanks, Paul. And, and you, you raise a real issue there about what people consider their own local bits of green belt. And I think during this pandemic, the green and open spaces have played such a part in people's lives and some people may have walked the dog there for that's their little patch of of, 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 of England if you want in some respects of that so I, I I really do feel that and I think as a cooperative executive we took the right route so we're going to do a transition committee and now got a full council to give every councillor an opportunity to speak if that's what they want on, on, on their patch uh, within their own ward I would like to thank Michael and the team and Simon and the team for the work that we've done and I'm conscious that we need to get on with this but I also want to uh, also um, mention Councillor Mazarik Bauer I think driving this and he must have been backwards and forwards many times of, of trying to get here but I solely honestly base this on quality homes quality jobs and quality places to live 
and I think that's where we are. And I think we got the two recommendations. I think we're in the right place to go to full council now. Let, let, let's listen to the debate, and then as an executive, we'll make that final decision. And hopefully, that, that will be back in February, and then we can crack on with this. And as, as council chairman is quite right, let us get get what we designated on this land and not let the developers boss us about anymore. So thanks to the team. Thanks, colleagues. Can we accept those recommendations? Thanks, everybody. Thanks. And I think this is the start of a, a long journey, but it starts at this step. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Janet. And apologies, Paul did alert me to this, but Janet Sharp had left the room, so apologies for that. Um, otherwise, we would, uh, we'd have took you early, sorry. Um, so, again, if you could just kind of introduce yourself, introduce the report, and accept my apologies. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Janet Sharp. I'm the Director of Housing at Sheffield City Council. Um, I would like to introduce um, the Leedless Valley uh, Master Plan uh, report uh, today. Um, this is to seek approval to consult with residents and local stakeholders at Leedless Valley on some draft uh, proposals um, for the master plan for this area. So, just a short um, overview, really, is that we agreed to carry out uh, a master plan for the Leedless Valley, uh, going right back to 2017, and have been working over the last four to five years with um, residents, the community, uh, local elected members, um, and key stakeholders who all have come together and provided some fantastic information about what they feel about Leedless Valley, what works, what doesn't work, what needs changing, what would make Leedless Valley, you know, the, the beautiful place and, and a proud estate once more to live in and work in. So, um, so since 2017, we've done a whole range 
of engagement activity um, with the community. Um, and we have translated that feedback and working with our, our partner, Master Planning Partner, Urbed, to come up with a set of proposals. So one, one of the things that we now need to do uh, is to go back out to the community and particularly residents and local stakeholders um, to ask for their views on those proposals. And when we receive that further feedback, what we will then do is look at that feedback and see if any of the draft master plan proposals need to change, be refined in some way before we then bring those proposals formally forward to executive cooperative meeting for final approval. Uh, so hopefully the report is fairly straightforward. Um, a lot of work has taken place and I think, um, you know, a credit to everybody involved, particularly local members and especially the community and residents at Leedless Valley. Um, one of the things I do need to, to draw your attention to that is whatever happens with regard to this master plan, we have held off from, from carrying out some significant capital investment in that area to the, that housing. Um, and it's starting to show and we need to really uh, consider um, you know, if, any, uh, if there is any further delay because we need to get out there and improve those, those homes uh, to, to avoid uh, any further uh, deterioration of the stock at Leedless Valley. So, so we've, we've covered, as you can see in the report, it's not just about housing, it's also about the open space, it's also about the facilities, it's about how we can improve uh, youth provision in the area, how we can encourage all age play in the area, and also to make sure that the area is safer, feels safer, and also is better signposted of, you know, the fantastic place that Leedless Valley is and can be. Um, so the improvements are taking a very holistic approach in terms of what is needed at Leedless Valley moving forward. But, but what we do need to do is ask the community at Leedless Valley what they think. Happy to take any questions. Thank, thank, thanks, Janet. Any questions on the plan? Comments? Kate, thanks, Paul. Uh, thank you to Janet and the team because there have been so many people involved in this. And I've been involved right from the start. Every single consultation meeting, all the engagement forums and all the member elect all the elected members meetings. So I've been every I, I feel as though I'm sort of giving birth to this in a way. <laughs> it's had a lot. So I really welcome this and I'm really pleased we've got to this stage. I'm really pleased that we've got a whole range of plans in here, not just for the housing, it's for the it's about the people as well as the built environment. Um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what the people of Leedless Valley think about it. We have had a bit of a hiccup in the process because of the intervention of COVID, but then that's had such a horrible impact on lots of people's lives, never mind this piece of work. Um, so that's why it has taken so long. I think the consultation material is very good and a lot of work's gone into that as well. So thank you for all the work that's gone into it. Um, fully support it and we'll be out there listening COVID securely, of course, uh, to any of the um, uh, feedback that we get from, from the people of Leedless Valley. So I'm really pleased to see it. Thank you. And fully support the recommendations. Thank, thank, thanks, Kate. Paul? Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, thanks again, Janet, and uh, to Jill and the team as well, because I know that you, you've got a really good... Uh, compact but very high quality team um, uh, working with you there and, and you've done a great thing yet. Um, I mean, I've, I've been involved in it as well since before I was elected as, as a member of the public and representing the public and I, I remember when I, I first was uh, standing for election speaking to a resident of Gleadless, uh, uh, you know, what do you think? And they're like, it's a load of money to, do, to, to talk a load of rubbish and do nothing. And that was the attitude in the beginning and I think the consultations have have improved that and and I think that the the proposals really are something to be proud of and I think that they're really going to benefit Gleadless and you know it's the the whole process has really turned something of uh, suspicion into something 
that will have a, a long-lasting positive impact on, on the area and the people who live there, and much more than housing, the work on jobs and skills and so on, and things for young people to do, just really good. And um, I mean, still a little bit short of renewable energy so far, but we don't know, the consultation hasn't begun yet, do we? So, yeah, just really looking forward to it, looking forward to speaking to the people over the next few weeks. And, and, and again, thanks to you and Jill and, and everybody else. Cheers. Thank, thank, thank you, Paul. Jane? Yeah, I'd just like to thank you, Janet. Um, I was up there at, right at the very beginning, yeah, before it was ever anything down on paper. Which, yeah, I was the midwife. No, it wasn't the midwife, you know. <laughs> We're getting a little bit overtired. Uh, no, at the very, very beginning, when it was really important that things were very out in the open, because this is about people's homes, communities, memories, everything. So when you start that conversation very early on, you always don't really have an awful lot there, but that is why it's where it is today. And that is a path and, pro and process that we have to go through. So I'm very pleased and I'm so glad that the local councillors are. And I know that the tenants knew that that was, you know, they were, they were really on board and they knew it would take this length of time. Or maybe quite not so long if it hadn't been for the pandemic. But well done and pass my thanks on. And I know Councillor Wood would want to say that as well. So on behalf of him and uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jen, and I know Councillor Wood was here. I'm sure he would be beefing that up and, and thanking local councillors for, for taking the, the time and the trouble to develop this, 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 this master plan, etc. So, So, um, we've got the recommendations on this to get on with the, recommend, uh, with the uh, well, consultation. It's been all meeting. Thank you. Uh, should, can we note their reports? And Janet, again, thank you on, on behalf of us for, 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 for where we've got to at this moment in time. Can we agree those recommendations? Agreed? Thank you very much. Thank Thanks you, Janet. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just why Janet's leaving, I've got no notes of any urgent business, so can I thank you all today for, for uh, today's meeting. It's been a long agenda, but there has been absolutely some crucial decisions made today, uh, and look forward to getting on with this on behalf of uh, Sheffield. Thanks, everyone. Bye.